Liberal Viewer presents. So, welcome to the January 2nd, 2023 edition of Liberal Viewer Monday Media Mix-Up. Happy New Year. Thanks for joining me. Uh, give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for the new year if you uh, like my mix-up of the clips from the big five corporate outlets of ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, and Fox News, their Sunday morning news analysis shows. And I add my political commentary and media criticism for my fair use, uh, non-copyright infringing show that I do every week. Uh, and I appreciate those who join me live. Also, my recorded show viewers who leave the comments later in the week. I get more of a chance to read those just because I'm not busy producing the show and doing all this stuff. And uh, anyway, as you can see from the video title, the topic this week is... 2022 was a good year for democracy, and that's true both here in the United States and uh, seemingly around the world. Uh, uh, if you saw the thumbnail for my video, uh, it was uh, more focusing on, well, there's Donald Trump being a big loser of 2022, and uh, I'll talk about that when I get to some clips, and also China and Russia, uh, big authoritarian regimes, especially China. Russia, more like the junior authoritarian partner, but more uh, aggressive than China. Uh, they both uh, had some setbacks in 2022, so that's good for people who don't believe in authoritarianism, I guess, and uh, that will be something I'll discuss briefly, especially when I get to, uh, if you look down in the video description, you can see short summaries of all my clips, and if you get all the way to the 10th of my 10 clips, uh, that's when I will be talking a little bit about uh, the big surge in COVID in China I was talking about a couple weeks ago that could possibly lead to millions of people dying. That would, <sighs> And you'll see that when you get to clip 10, it's discussed in an economic way. But uh, most of the clips are focused on how 2022 had good news for the survival of American democracy here in the United States and uh, the... Uh, the decrease in Donald Trump's popularity, his increasing legal troubles, the more Republicans who are uh, blaming him for being a loser. That's another reason uh, he's like a loser of 2022. Uh, but uh, one of the things that also showed that he was a loser was uh, the release of his tax returns, uh, which isn't really on my main topic. But uh, for my political comedy, I want to show you some really bad cross-examination on Fox News Sunday. Uh, Jillian Turner isn't quite the political hack that Shannon Bream is, the usual host of Fox News Sunday, but she did a really bad job of cross-examining the uh, outgoing ranking member of the House Ways and Means Committee, uh, Kevin Brady, when he asserted that somehow Trump has always been under audit. He apparently is the folk, uh, the target of the eternal audit. You may, may remember last week I criticized Fox News Sunday for never even mentioning the fact that Trump lied about how he would have released his tax returns when he was running for president, except he was under audit. And, you know, everyone will tell you you can't release a tax return when it's under audit. And first, that's not true. Uh, and he did have like one return or like a few returns from around 2010 that had been under audit for like a really long time. But that might be the basis of what Representative Kevin Brady is saying here. That's totally not true that uh, the Fox News anchor or guest host of Fox News Sunday, Jillian Turner, does a really bad job of cross-examining him on. And I will talk about that with you a little more after we watch this. I mean, it is, it's a newsmaker clip, but it, the bias is so bad in the cross-examination that it, I think it qualifies as political comedy this week, which I'll talk about with you a little more after we watch that clip together over here. In his district, at the end of the day, uh, he's got to make a, that, that decision. Um, talking about the former president's tax returns now, um, you railed against the Democrats' decision this week to release those. Let's take, play a quick look back. Uh, over our uh, objections in opposition, Democrats on the Ways and Means Committee have uh, unleashed a dangerous new political weapon uh, that overturns decades of privacy protections for average taxpayers. 
the era of political targeting and of Congress's enemies list is back. Uh, as you well know, sir, it has been this tradition in American politics dating back to the late 60s. The presidents voluntarily or candidates release their tax returns. Why is it that President Trump, in your estimation, should be an exception to history? Well, this isn't about whether President Trump should have released it. That's not the law. It's a tradition. And it's not what is in those tax returns. Frankly, that's between the taxpayer and the IRS. This is a dangerous new precedent. It overturns 50 years of protections uh, for, for American taxpayers uh, that, that began in the Watergate era, era. Now that's all changed. So simply the Ways and Means Chairman and Senate Finance Chairman of either party has nearly unlimited power to target private citizens, not just public officials, not just political enemies, not just Supreme Court justices, but private Americans to seize their tax returns and make them public, usually in an effort to embarrass or destroy them politically. And so every American ought to be frightened by this precedent because, as I said, the enemies list is back and you may well find yourself on it. Um, take a listen to the former president in his own words here, sir. I'll get your reaction. While I'm under audit, I won't do it. If I'm not under audit, I would do it. I had no problem with it. But while I'm under audit, I would not give my taxes. I would love to give them, but I'm not going to do it while I'm under audit. It's very simple. Well, in the release, sir, there is no evidence that the president was under audit during the years he told the American people multiple times that he was and used that as the justification to not release his returns voluntarily. Well, in, in the returns we saw, he is under audit for all six of those um, uh, tax return years, plus a number of eight, I think, of his business ventures that are affiliated as well. Those audits are not yet complete. Uh, that's accurate. But, but this is not the point here, Jillian. The uh, point sir, here he, is, as far as for we the know, first he time, was under audit from 2009 to 2013. He told the American people he was under audit when he was running for office. So, uh, to my point, all of those six years that have been released are still under audit. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, it isn't about whether he should release it or not. It is whether Americans should be targeted by members of Congress for uh, political purposes and having their private taxpayer uh, returns released and made public. This is the new reality. I think this is a dangerous new president, precedent, and every American you know, ought to be frightened. Sir, I don't want to belabor the point. I just want to get some clarification here. You're saying you've seen evidence that the president was, in fact, under audit between 2015 and 2020, is that right? In, in the six years that of returns have been released, he's under audit by the IRS in all six years. Um, I want to turn to this now. Um, <coughs> that, I mean, the last thing Kevin Baker said wasn't true, although he did have that weird Freudian slip about a minute before the end where he talked about a dangerous president, I mean, precedent. <laughs> that was kind of amusing. I almost used that as, I mean, that itself uh, qualifies the clip as the political comedy. But the cross-examination, I mean, at one point, Julian Turner does sort of state the fact that he wasn't under audit for any of those six years. He was under audit, well, she said 2009 to 2013. The, in two, I've, like, researched this uh, before doing the show, and... In 2010, apparently, Donald Trump claimed like a 73 mil or 72, 73 million dollar tax refund based on getting back all the taxes he'd paid in like the previous three years, which if you have like a big business loss and it offsets taxes you've paid in previous years is something you can actually do where like uh, if you like lose as much money as you paid in taxes in previous years, you can call it a loss and get your the amount you paid in taxes back or whatever or it's not actually the amount you paid in taxes it's actually if you lose as much in income as you made in those previous years then you can get those taxes back but it also uh, generates like an automatic audit and so trump was under audit for on his taxes for that 2009 like 70 plus million dollar refund uh, based on the few years before that, all the way up to like 2013, like Jillian Turner was saying. And I think, you know, sometimes Trump <laughs> told these lies that didn't even have a kernel of truth. In, you know, a lot of like uh, 
Fox News bias spin that I used to document in my Fox News bias videos, there was like a little kernel of truth that they spun into this big misleading story, and maybe that is like the middle, the, the little misleading kernel of truth in Trump's whole, like, I'm under audit, I'm under audit, but he wasn't under audit for the tax returns uh, after that period, uh, the six years that were just released, the 2015 through 2020 returns that were just released, and Jillian Turner kind of pointed that out, but then let Kevin Baker get away with like claiming they were under audit. I mean, one of the stories that came out is when Trump was president, even though the IRS had a regulation, it's not a law, it's like an IRS regulation that says every president has to be audited every year they didn't start auditing him till 2019 after the democrats took back the house and requested trump's tax returns which is a little suspicious and uh then they only put like one guy on it who had no expertise in like all the voluminous you know accountant accounting tricks that trump had used in his tax returns and that was something you saw in the news summaries uh, that I showed last week, and uh, Julian Turner could have done a much better job cross-examining that, like, bogus talking point, basically, from, I mean, it's not like Kevin Baker, the ranking member on the House Ways and Means Committee, although he's an outgoing Republican now, uh, it's not like he didn't know all that, uh, but, uh, I don't know, she was, like, way too soft on him, and when, uh, I show the uh, Fox News Sunday news summary in the clip after next. It ends with uh, Jillian Turner saying like like way too many laudatory things about someone they're about to have on as a politician who they're supposed to be, you know, in an adversarial relationship. But, you know, that's not something that only happens on Fox News where they're like too close to the subjects that they are supposed to be interrogating. But anyway, that was my political comedy clip in terms of the bias and I think I explained why I think it was so biased though <laughs> just that whole dangerous president I mean precedent part that I mean that alone qualifies it as political comedy like I said but uh, the next two news summaries the two longest ones uh, Bol uh, NBC News Meet the Press is a little over six minutes and then Fox News Sunday is a little under six minutes and in terms of like newsiness actually this week i have to give it over to fox news because they actually reported on a bunch of things that were happening you know i criticized uh several of the news programs last week on christmas for not really reporting the news and uh, like cnn state of the union had this interview with the uh first second gentleman doug emhoff you know uh, vice president kamala harris's husband that was apparently recorded like two months ago when they were passing it off as news and NBC News Meet the Press had like this clip show of their 75th anniversary special and this week's NBC News Meet the Press also looked like I'm not sure when it was recorded I mean sometime since like Elon Musk become the, became the head of Twitter because uh, that's you'll see it, it's not really on anything newsy this week uh, it was more on the, you know the danger of social media and so the Fox News Sunday news summary even though it's you know biased and uh, heavily in favor of Republicans it actually more covers the news than Chuck Todd where I mean I would say he has the biggest uh, longest package this week but most of it is actually him live narrating uh, a somewhat smaller New Year's package I don't know if he's like made some New Year's resolution to have a smaller package in 2023 but uh, most of this is not pre-recorded it's chuck todd's narration of the danger of social media which was the big topic of their special meet the press starting off the new year that i will talk about with you a little more after we watch it together over here sunday morning happy new year 2023 is here this morning we're going to take a deep dive into the social media platforms that profit from grabbing onto and monetizing our attention to the tune of billions of dollars a year and with almost no regulation. A majority agree social media's influence on our democracy and our national security is a big problem. 64% of Americans believe social media has been a bad thing for our democracy, two thirds of the country, creating polarization and division and eroding civility in our politics. All of this according to a new Pew survey. It's an attention economy whose business model depends simply on persuading you 
that you and your way of life is somehow under attack in order to buy your time and attention, as whistleblowers from these companies have come to Capitol Hill to warn us about. I'm reminded of one conversation with an executive when I said, I am confident that we have a foreign agent, and their response was, well, since we already have one, what does it matter if we have more? Let's keep growing the office. And rather than address the serious issues raised by its own research, Meta Leadership chooses growing the company over keeping people safe. During my time at Facebook, I came to realize a devastating truth. Almost no one outside of Facebook knows what happens inside of Facebook. 85% of Americans say social media makes it easier to manipulate people with misinformation. We've seen it from Russian efforts to influence the presidential election to QAnon. In fact, one 2019 report tracking a dummy social media account set up to represent uh, an anonymous conservative mother in North Carolina found that Facebook's recommendation algorithms led her to QAnon in less than a week. And then there's the thriving anti-vaccine groups that the president himself called out last year. What's your message to platforms like Facebook? They're killing people. Facebook was used by members of Myanmar's military in a systematic campaign as a tool for genocide. And social media platforms from Facebook to Twitter were gasoline on the fire of the Capitol attack on January 6. A whopping 79% of Americans say the Internet and social media have made Americans more politically divided. Growing shares of both Republicans and Democrats say members of the other party are more immoral, dishonest, and closed-minded than other Americans. Perhaps it's because they only hear about the other party via social media and not normal interactions like we used to have in the pre-social media world. And social media companies are profiting off of Americans' anger online. Starting in 2017, Facebook's ranking algorithm treated angry emoji reactions as five times more valuable than likes. Why? Well, anger generates clicks, and clicks generate profit. What's happening on social media is the equivalent of using the same pipes for your drinking water and the sewer system. The better you are at innovating a new way to be divisive, we will pay you in more likes, followers, and retweets. Has partisanship in television and radio pre-existed social media? Yes. Have we ever wired up the most powerful artificial intelligence in the world, pointed at your brainstem, to show you the most enraging content on a daily basis, and the longer you scroll, the more you get? We have never done that before. We are experimenting on brains. America. And the business has never been bigger. When Pew began tracking social media adoption in 2005, just 5% of American adults used at least one of these platforms. Now, the number is 72%. 82% of Americans are on YouTube, 70% are on Facebook. And ready for this? Four of these companies have more than a billion worldwide users. That's more than the population of every country in the world but two. None of these companies has a financial incentive to change. Social networking sites in the United States brought in more than $72 billion last year. The reality is our country is deeply divided right now, and that isn't something that tech companies alone can fix. For us, it's much more important to sort of look at, like, the, the big ideas that might influence the way that tech evolves in the future, and more importantly, to build a strategy that does not rely on government intervention for our success. Twitter has become kind of the de facto town square, um, so... Uh, it, it, it's just really important that people have the, both the, uh, the reality and the perception uh, that they are able to speak freely within the bounds of the law. So we invited Meta, Twitter, Google, Snap, and TikTok onto this broadcast to defend their practices and simply have a conversation about the future of their platforms and what can be done here. All of them declined. We did receive a statement from TikTok, and we got links to previously written blog posts from the other companies. The last real legislation that spells out who is legally responsible for content on the internet was signed into law 27 years ago, the last century. In 1996, only a fifth of Americans had ever booted up the World Wide Web. Section 230, as it's known, says, no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as a publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider. In other words, these companies are not to be held liable for harmful or inaccurate content a user posts on their sites and can't be sued. Of course, the question is, the minute they use an algorithm, do they actually become a publisher? This law was written before the algorithms had taken hold. Now, in Washington, Section 230 is under more scrutiny than ever. 
with more than 30 bills proposed on social media during the last Congress. But despite all those bills proposed, none of them have passed. 24 years ago, 46 states and big tobacco reached the largest settlement of civil litigation claims in U.S. history. And tobacco companies changed their marketing practices and paid states more than $200 billion in restitution. When we realize products are toxic for us, we pass laws to change them, or we hold companies accountable in a court of law to force the change. Facebook whistleblower and former data scientist Frances Haugen became one of the greatest sources this century when she turned over thousands of confidential company documents, sharing them with regulators, journalists, and with lawmakers. When we realized big tobacco was hiding the harms it caused, the government took action. When we figured out cars were safer with seatbelts, the government took action. And when our government learned that opioids were taking lives, the government took action. I implore you to do the same here. And Francis Haugen joins me now. Welcome to the and yeah, he said something about Francis Haugen being like the greatest whistleblower of this century, which uh, that <laughs> there were some other whistleblowers this century makes me think of uh, Edward Snowden or uh, 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 I'm, I'm thinking of the old name Bradley Manning. Uh, I can't, uh, but anyway, the uh, lots of things came through WikiLeaks. And uh, I don't know if uh, Francis H Haugen is the greatest. That seemed like a exaggeration for a exclusive guest on Meet the Press. Uh, let me look down at my uh, live viewers here. But oh, I uh, see that people are talking about Section Two Hundred and Thirty, and this is actually something I I know a little bit about. You know, I actually am a lawyer and. I have some background in free speech, and I'm uh, putting some more effort into learning about some of the, the cutting-edge things in uh, litigation on uh, Internet freedom of speech. Uh, there are things happening this year for me uh, in terms of my involvement as a volunteer with the ACLU, where I'm going to possibly learn more about uh ACLU litigation through in the ACLU of Northern California, which is in the cutting edge of the, since we include Silicon Valley, uh, it has a lot of cutting edge uh, technology and uh, civil liberties litigation. And I'm going to know more about the, that this year, and I'll talk about that maybe in shows coming up in 2023. But uh, I notice there in the NBC News Meet the Press news summary about the threat of social media to uh, social media platforms to our democracy that uh, Chuck Todd uh, he uh, he said one thing I kind of like the where he said or there was one metaphor where he was talking about how it's like getting our water and our sewage through the same pipes I mean I've listened to, you know, I watch these clips at least three times, you know, once when I'm watching the shows, once when I'm capturing the clips, and then once again when I'm watching it with all of you, and uh, it, you know, I actually kind of like that metaphor the first time, but now watching it the third time, I'm not sure, you know, metaphors tend to be uh, uh, more distracting than illuminating in my, uh, in my experience with uh, how you... Uh, argue something that if you like uh, the creation of a metaphor just puts someone off on some tangent and i'm not sure what the water versus sewage metaphor is really supposed to tell you but uh i did like the part about uh how they are experimenting on our brains to figure out how to produce rage because rage is the emotion that is most monetizable that was uh, a good piece of information to promote you know that supported the argument there that social media platforms are the real threat to democracy uh, the one other thing that I thought was a little overblown though was the uh, analogy between uh, big tobacco and social media platforms I mean tobacco like kills people directly chemically uh, I mean, there's this whole free speech aspect to social media where, you know, people are being killed by ideas. That's not, 
quite the same thing as being killed by smoking, but you can let me know what you think. And, oh, by the way, I've been watching my live viewers along the way. I did see that uh, near the begin beginning of the program, I got a Super Chat contr contribution from Tom Trask, one of my longtime viewers, and uh, a Happy New Year's wish. And I wish Tom Trask, but also all of my viewers, a Happy New Year. And thank you for that Super Chat contribution. Um, uh, I'd say at least half of my videos in 2022 got demonetized for like controversial topics for almost the entire time that they were viewable or that people were actually watching them because most of my views come in the first 24 and 48 hours and uh, then I won like 80% of the appeals of those demonetizations and uh, anyway uh, it's kind of like what Chuck Todd was talking about like the danger of social media well that's why YouTube and you saw Chuck Todd ask for like YouTube and Meta and TikTok to appear on the program and they all said no why no why didn't they ask anyone from Twitter that that was one of my questions also from that last uh, news summary but anyway uh, I want want to con contrast that last news summary from NBC News's Meet the Press, which, I mean, it was very journalistic, but it was not very newsworthy. Like I said, it, when did they, could, could you prove that they didn't record that like a week ago or three weeks ago or any time? I noticed they mentioned Elon Musk was the CEO of Twitter, but there was nothing like that happened after that that uh, showed up in that news summary, so it could be months old for all we know. Uh, compare that to this next next news summary from Fox News Sunday. It has like all the political bias you would expect from an organization that actually wasn't set up for journalism. If you read uh, this book right over here by Gabriel Sherman, uh, The Loudest Voice in the Room, you will see that Fox News was actually created to be the propaganda arm of the Republican Party and uh, all that political bias is in uh, this new summary that, uh, well, <laughs> the first part, uh, there are three, uh, there's the anchor, Jillian Turner, uh, and then there are two reporters in this new summary. Uh, first, it's uh, Lauren Green uh, talking about how the Biden administration is responsible for this breakdown in air travel and Southwest, which is totally against brand for, you know, right-wing conservative Republicans. And they're supposed to, you know, why isn't the government regulating big corporations more? That's like not their usual tack. But, you know, when air travel gets snarled, all of a sudden it's Pete Buttigieg's fault for big government not, you know, being totally on top of what the private sector is doing at all times which uh, that's kind of bogus and then they go over to Jackie Heinrich making it look like Biden's on vacation in the Virgin Islands golfing while the whole country is coming to shit or whatever I don't know you can I think I've over uh, I pre-criticized the Fox News Sunday news summary but it's still kind of more newsy than the one from Meet the Press which was the point I was trying to make by juxtaposing these two new summaries, and I'll talk about that maybe a little more after we watch that clip together over here. Hello from Fox News in Washington. Happy New Year to everybody at home. Well, President Biden returns to D.C. this week, but there will be a new sheriff over on Capitol Hill. House Republicans now have the majority setting them up to be a forceful check on the White House. GOP leader Kevin McCarthy faces an uphill battle in his push to become House Speaker. President Biden himself will kick off the second half of his term under intense pressure to announce a run for a second term. Right now, the only player on the 2024 field officially is former President Trump. He's blasting Democrats' decision this week to release his tax returns. In a moment, we'll conduct Republican Congressman Kevin Brady's exit interview as he prepares to depart Washington. He's been an outspoken critic of the Democrats' decision to release those tax returns. We begin first this morning with news from Rome. The Vatican says Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI passed away Saturday morning at 95. 
Catholic leaders and congregations around the world are honoring his passing today. He is most remembered outside the church for his surprise resignation. We've got Fox team coverage this morning. Jackie Heinrich is traveling with President Biden, but we begin first with Lauren Green. She's live outside Vatican City looking at the Basilica with reaction to the pontiff's passing. Hi, Lauren. Hey, Jillian. Well, on today, there are preparations in St. Peter's Basilica for the viewing and funeral of Pope Benedict XVI, and it's really unprecedented. There's never been a former pope in the modern era. And, for example, journalists are asking, where is there a guest list of people who may be, might be attending? We're also learning more about the last moments of Benedict's life. Uh, the emeritus pope died yesterday, as you said, in his first floor apartments at the Mater Ecclesia Monastery at the Vatican Gardens. A source close to the Vatican said that Benedict's last words were said in German, his native tongue, Jesus, ich liebe dich, Jesus, I love you. Pope Francis celebrated the New Year's Day Mass today, only mentioning Benedict in the prayers for the faithful. And tributes from all over the world. President Biden, the Catholic, tweeted of Benedict. He'll be remembered as a renowned theologian with a lifetime of devotion to the church, guided by his principles of, and faith. May he continue to be an inspiration to all. Benedict will also be remembered as the first pope in six centuries to resign, paving the way for a Francis papacy. And by the way, in about an hour, Francis is scheduled to go visit the um, casket and uh, body of uh, Pope Benedict. The body will be moved tomorrow morning to St. Peter's Basilica for the faithful to come and pay their last respects. Jillian. The world will be watching that. Lauren Green reporting from Rome today. Thank you. Let's turn now to Jackie Heinrich. She joins us from the U.S. Virgin Islands. Hi, Jackie. Good morning, Jillian. President Biden writes that he and the First Lady are mourning the passing of Pope Emeritus like Catholics around the world. He also released a statement commemorating the death of Barbara Walters. We've seen very little of President Biden on his vacation before the new Republican-controlled Congress greets him in 2023. President Biden keeping a light agenda on holiday in St. Croix, where he previously said he'd firm up his re-election plans. Did you talk to your family about running for re-election, sir? There's an election coming up? Yeah. I didn't know that. No clues about his decision expected early this year, but the White House is already gearing up for a fight with Republicans in the second half of this term. The Biden administration sent a signal loud and clear, we're going to do everything in our ability to prevent and block your oversight. The White House Counsel's Office rejecting oversight demands from House Republicans made over the last two years, claiming they carried no weight coming from the minority and will have to be resubmitted. We're simply going to copy and paste and only change the date. The incoming oversight committee chair says the White House is stalling investigations into the southern border, fentanyl, the energy crisis, the Afghanistan withdrawal, COVID origins, and more. And while the White House claims they intend to work in good faith with the GOP, an official statement also took a dig likening subpoena threats to political stunts that, quote, suggest House Republicans might be spending more time thinking about how to get booked on Hannity than preparing to work together to help the American people. People. Republicans also blasting the administration over the Southwest Airlines meltdown, stranding thousands while President Biden vacationed in the Caribbean. Pete Buttigieg doesn't have any idea what he's doing. He supposedly met with them already and obviously did nothing. The Transportation Secretary vowing accountability. We're also in a position to use uh, enforcement powers and fines to hold airlines to uh, the things that, that they have now committed to us, pledged to us in writing. And the White House has kept quiet on the House Speaker's race. Leader Kevin McCarthy still short of the votes he would need to lead the chamber. McCarthy previously met with Biden and congressional leaders to discuss the lame duck session. But at this point, it's unclear who Biden will have to work with in the new Congress. Jillian. Jackie Heinrich reporting from St. Croix this morning for us. Jackie, thank you. As House Republicans prepare to assume leadership and swear in new members, they're also saying goodbye to some longtime colleagues. This includes Texas Republican Kevin Brady. He's stepping down after 26 years in office. He's a longtime leading member of the House Ways and Means Committee. He was also a major force in passing the 2017 Trump tax cuts. He is known inside Washington for working across the aisle with Democrats. Here's how Ways and Means Chairman Richard Neal puts it. Quote, Kevin Brady during the Trump years was Kevin Brady during the Biden years. I trusted him. Congressman Brady joins me now for a bit of an exit interview. 
And yeah, did, I mean, I almost got the impression that uh, Fox News let Kevin Brady write his own intro there. I mean, could it have been more like laudatory than, uh, you know, he's been a great leader reaching ac across the aisle like uh, a uh, standard bearer for truth, justice in the American way. Here he comes, outgoing ranking member on House Ways and Means, Kevin Brady. And anyway, I already showed like the bad cross examination of Kevin Brady earlier. Uh, but uh, and when I did, I mentioned that Jillian Turner was going to like engage in that puffery that I think you just saw before uh, she asked the tough questions about Trump's tax returns that weren't that tough at all. But uh, I also mentioned before I showed that news summary how I think they overfocused on Joe Biden golfing when I don't remember Donald Trump's golfing and he did a hell of a lot of golfing during his presidency. Didn't get the play you just saw in that news summary. Uh, and as I mentioned before I showed the clip, I think they were like way too hard on Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg being responsible for the breakdown in Southwest Airlines, even though Southwest Southwest Airlines is like a private company that you know it's the private sector that Fox News is always saying is where we should like put our trust in the private sector not in government regulation but uh, Southwest Airlines that got like seven billion dollars of a bailout during the Trump administration with uh, Republicans in Congress uh, now they're saying that should be investigated and they never mentioned you know, they just said, the government gave them a $7 billion bailout. But, I mean, whose government was that who gave them Southwest that $7 billion that now needs to be investigated by the Republican Congress? Well, it was a Republican Congress and Donald Trump and, well, split Congress and Donald Trump. But anyway, uh, I think I pretty much pre-criticized that. Um, and if not, I mentioned what was necessary to criticize uh, right there but I did I was watching uh, the live comments and uh, this is kind of something that uh, uh oh what have I done now I was trying to add a photo and I think I added it to like one of my other here let's try it here so uh, yeah I saw this live comment uh, during that last clip uh, so yeah that was uh, Christopher L. Perez Cruz saying that uh, I took my Matt Taibbi book down not woke enough for you anymore liberal viewer and uh, I mean, I actually really like this Matt Taibbi book here, The Divide, and I, uh, I made a, a video, like a book review of both The New Jim Crow and Matt Taibbi's book, The Divide, although The, the New Jim Crow, which has always been up, up there and has stood the test of time, is the better book, and I think I said that in the video where I reviewed the two books. Matt Taibbi, uh, I mean, he did some things that I really enjoyed, and I liked him. I mean, where he, like, started going wrong, Matt Taibbi and uh, Glenn Greenwald, right behind my uh, Mr. Spock cup, uh, there's this Glenn Greenwald book, No Place to Hide, which I, uh, this is actually kind of this joke I make every week. I've hidden the book No Place to Hide behind some other books. So No Place to Hide actually found a place to hide on my bookshelf. But yeah, no, Glenn Greenwald and Matt Taibbi have like gone, done this weird thing where they like show up on Fox News and they're like contrarians to the, you know, liberal Biden establishment left. But uh, specifically regarding Matt Taibbi, where he kind of lost me is when he started uh, uh, being an apologist for people on the right wing who called the you know Trump Russia collusion story a hoax yeah and I've seen him I even I think I talked about this when he was on Bill Maher uh, I can't remember exactly when that was uh, or somewhere where he was cross-examined on claiming the Russia collusion thing was a hoax 
and he, you know, said, oh, that was overblown, but when, you know, if you point out, like, the real facts that support the, why Russia collusion was a real thing, you know, things like, uh, Trump's campaign manager, Paul Manafort, gave, uh, polling data to uh, Konstantin Kalimnik, who turned out to be a Russian intelligence agent that they could use to, like, target their, uh, you know, their social media buys for Wisconsin and Michigan and, uh, you know, the blue wall that uh, Trump broke to become president in 2016. And, of course, there's, you know, the Don Jr. meeting with uh, Russian assets in Trump Tower in June 2016. Uh, he, it wasn't something that could be prosecuted because uh, they decided like John Jr. was too stupid to form criminal intent, but it was still Russian collusion. And then of course there was the whole thing about how Roger Stone uh, colluded with WikiLeaks on the uh, release of information that Russia hacked from the DNC that, uh, you know, Roger Stone was actually convicted of lying about that and then pardoned by Donald Trump. So there was, you know, plenty of uh, Russia collusion. And uh, so, yeah, I kind of uh, lost some respect for Matt Taibbi when he became an apologist for the right wingers claiming that there was you know, no Russia collusion, and that that was like an indictment of the liberal media, and I don't, I don't know what the word woke is supposed to mean, but uh, Christopher, if that's what you're saying, he, he's not woke enough. I mean, it's just that he started being an apologist for a right-wing uh, talking point that I don't agree with, so that's my response to... Oh, and also, I like rotate the books. I mean, there's some books I always keep, but uh, like uh, the Michelle Alexander, uh, New Jim Crow, that's always going to be there. But a lot of these, oh, and Gabriel Sherman's The Loudest Voice in the Room, those are kind of like my two anchors, but any of the other books are subject to being to rotated. But anyway, that's my answer there, and uh, so kudos to you, Christopher, you got me off on a tangent, but I think I kind of answered that comment. And, uh, so I showed the, uh, NBC news, meet the press news summary, the Fox news Sunday news summary, and sort of juxtapose those. Uh, the other ones are all shorter, uh, starting with ABC's this week with George Stephanopoulos. Uh, Jonathan Carl was the host this week. Uh, and you'll see he, I mean, they have a little bit, they have a bias towards Barbara Walters having died, who was an ABC icon, and then their executive producer, Dax Tahara, also died, so they talk about them, uh, you know, but that's like, I guess, journalistic privilege, you can talk about people you know when they die more, or I don't know, and then they have a little, a little bit of a look into the House Speaker's race, uh, but actually more in-depth then you saw in that whole Fox News Sunday news summary and then the upcoming presidential race, which I will talk about with you a little more after we watch that news summary together over here. Good morning and welcome to this week. We begin 2023 remembering two of our colleagues at ABC News, the pioneering Barbara Walters, whose interviews with world leaders, politicians and celebrities are legendary and whose career paved the way for countless women in journalism. And Dax Tahara, our talented and beloved executive producer who left us and his family far too soon. We will honor both of them this morning, but we start with what is already on day one shaping up to be a fascinating, uncertain, and profoundly consequential year in American politics. In just two days, the House will gather to elect a speaker with no clear indication of whether Republican leader Kevin McCarthy or anyone else has the votes. The uncertainty has major ramifications for Congress and the White House. Until a speaker is elected, the House cannot operate. No committees can be formed. Members can't even officially be sworn in. Quite a start for the new Republican majority. And when a speaker is finally chosen, President Biden faces a House determined to thwart his agenda and to investigate his administration and his family. 
Against that backdrop, the maneuvering for the 2024 campaign is well underway. President Biden strongly suggesting he's likely to run for re-election, something he said he'd be discussing with his family over the holidays. And of course, former President Trump is already a candidate, and at least a half dozen other Republicans are considering running against him. One of those Republicans is Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson, who is set to leave office later this month. He joins us. And I have a clip coming up of Asa Hutchinson, uh, clip number eight. If you look at the short summaries of the clips down in the video description, uh, he's one of a couple Republicans that I'll be showing, uh, along with Adam Kinzinger, some like uh, anti-Trump Republicans as that will give perspective as to whether Trump is fading as a force in the Republican Party, which would be good news for the uh, for democracy in 2023, like there was good news for democracy in 2022, the main topic of the video here. Um, but uh, I, I mean, I thought ABC did a good job of doing a shorter news summary there, and especially if you juxtapose it with Fox News, they did a lot more coverage of the uh, fracture in the Republican Party regarding uh, electing Speaker Kevin McCarthy, which uh, I've been hearing for, you know, if you watch uh, like the Sunday show with Jonathan Capehart, he had uh, guests on for months saying Kevin McCarthy will never be Speaker, and I'm still not seeing indications that he's actually going to be speaker. This is something that's happening tomorrow. You know, I'm recording this on Monday, January 2nd, January 3rd. We may see the first time in 100 years that a speaker is not elected on the first ballot. And, I mean, I have this weird feeling that the speaker is going to end up being Elise Stefanik. Uh, it could be Jim Jordan. It could be Andy Biggs, but I think any of those three are just as likely to be elected speaker as Kevin McCarthy because he can only lose four votes if he wants to be elected speaker. And uh, you saw some coverage of that from ABC there. Uh, that's going to be like a, a, something wild that happens tomorrow, and I'll be watching along with the rest of you. I'm kind of inter I, I mean I kind of have a feeling I mean that would be like the what the karma that Kevin McCarthy deserves to like go through all this obsequiousness uh, you know one thing I didn't I'm going to show you this Adam Kinzinger clip coming up uh, from ABC where he talks about whether he's optimistic about the threat to democracy in the United States but I cut out the part where he like totally reamed Kevin McCarthy for rehabilitating Donald Trump like a couple weeks after January 6th he went down to Mar-a-Lago and rehabilitated Donald Trump and he's done he's like not a leader he is like a, a total political schemer who has like worked for years with the only intention to gain power and would be so much uh, I would be engaging in so much like karmic schadenfreude if Kevin McCarthy tomorrow doesn't end up getting elected speaker and it's like Andy Biggs or Jim Jordan early or Elise Stefanik all of which I think have probably as much chance of being elected speaker as he does but anyway that was the extra comment I wanted to add about that and uh, the last two news summaries are much shorter uh, the CNN State of the Union one is just a little over a minute uh, I think, uh, I mean, it covers like the, the upcoming politics of 2023 briefly. And then, of course, it gives a little bit too much focus on the new diversity of governors because their exclusive guest is the first black governor of Maryland, Wes Moore, uh, which is a bias that all the different media has. Which they always have a bias towards like promoting their exclusive guests in terms of them being important in the news, which you can see in the CNN State of the Union news summary from Dana Bash yesterday that I will talk about with you a little more after we watch it together over here. Hello, I'm Dana Bash in Washington, where the State of Our Union is wishing you a Happy New Year. 
It is Sunday, January 1st, 2023, and we hope you're enjoying a restful holiday. Here in Washington this week, reality is going to set in quickly. On Tuesday, House Republicans will take control of the chamber and try to elect a speaker, and that could take a while. House Republicans are also planning to launch a slate of investigations into the Biden administration as Washington begins to adjust to divided government. There will be new faces in Congress and in state houses across the country, where you're going to see a lot of changes this month. There will be 12 women governors, two governors who are openly gay. And in Maryland, voters elected only the third black man ever to lead a state. Governor-elect Wes Moore is a veteran of the war in Afghanistan and a Rhodes Scholar who beat a Trump-backed Republican and flipped Maryland State House blue on his very first run for office. Now he is trying to tackle income inequality and rewrite narratives about what the Democratic Party stands for. Here with me now is incoming Maryland Governor Wes Moore. Thank you so much. Okay, and I think I pretty much pre-criticized that clip, but uh, the final news summaries from CBS News Face the Nation, Margaret Brennan, I kind of made fun of their news summary last week because it was so brief, even though they were one of the two. It was only Face the Nation and Fox News Sunday that even like covered news on Christmas last week, uh, which was the topic of my live stream. But uh, the new summary at the beginning of the program before they got to their guest was something like uh, 2022 was ending, but many issues will continue into 2023. That was basically the new summary of that uh, last week. And this week is like a little bit better, but not much. And actually, their whole program was not very newsy. They like talked to a whole bunch of people involved in like the economy and finance uh, oh, and climate change. There was a segment on climate change, but uh, also Face the Nation this week seemed like it might not have even been recorded any time in the last several days it might not have been the news and the news summary is like uh the economy and uh foreign policy and the environment are all going to be 2023 issues the 2023 outlook and that's not really a news summary but here's margaret brennan trying to get away with it yesterday on face the nation over here Good morning, happy new year, and welcome to Face the Nation. For this first day of 2023, we want to look forward, offering the outlook ahead on the economy, foreign policy, and the environment, taking advantage of at least one quiet Sunday here in Washington before the new Congress convenes later this week. We began with a look at the domestic economic forecast and the chief economist for Bank of America, Michael Gapin. He's here. Happy new year to you, and it's good to have so yeah, was it really a quiet Sunday though? I mean, the January 6th committee released all these transcripts, uh, the Trump tax returns got released, and like none of that really got covered on Face the Nation. It wasn't really that quiet a Sunday, and I'm not sure why Face the Nation spent their whole program interviewing people uh, about like more long-term issues. I, I got the feeling that they didn't actually work on Sunday and some of those interviews had been pre-recorded and anyway but if you go down in the video description to the links to sources you can see pretty much the entire Face the Nation program split into clips on their YouTube channel so you can watch it there and you can let me know if you think it was pre-recorded and not newsy and uh, hopefully now that I've finished my programs from last week that were on New Year's and my programs from this week that were on New Year's Day. We won't have to be dealing with a whole bunch of uh, corporate news journalists who are really on vacation when they were supposed to be giving us the news. But anyway, uh, that seems to be what's happening on some of the programs in the last couple weeks. But <sighs> just lazy journalism, if you ask me. But now I'm going to get to the two other Republican newsmakers. I mean, I showed uh, uh, Kevin Brady in my uh, 
political comedy or Fox News bias clip at the beginning talking about Trump's tax returns. Uh, next, I'm going to have uh, two other Republicans first, uh, and these are sort of like anti-Trump or never-Trump Repu Republicans trying to save the Republican Party from Donald Trump. First, Adam Kinzinger, uh, first talking about whether Trump should be uh, prosecuted for a crime, but then also whether he's optimistic about uh, whether U.S. democracy is going to survive. And then I'll get to Asa Hutchinson in the second clip. But here's Adam Kinzinger, retiring member of Congress, unlike uh, the... Uh, clip I showed at the beginning from uh, Kevin Brady who's retiring but not really repudiating the Trump wing. Adam Kinzinger is retiring and really repudiating the Trump wing of the Republican Party as you can see in his response to Dana Bash on CNN State of the Union yesterday over here. So he should be charged and convicted. That's so. That's my personal opinion. It's not from a uh, from Based a lawyer on the or justice evidence department. That you've been collecting. Yes, and it appears like I look at that and I go, if he is not guilty of a crime, then I, I frankly fear for the future of this country because now every future president can say, hey, here's the bar, and the bar is do everything you can to stay in power. You talk about the the future of this country as you are. Uh, on your way out and uh, leaving Congress behind. Are you optimistic or fearful for American democracy? It's <sighs> a tough question. So typically I'm always optimistic. I try to be, you can't do this job if you're not. I'm a little fearful in the short term. You know, we're in a moment where facts don't really matter. What matters to people is just uh, what your opinion is and the facts that, that comport to that matter. We're in, a, we're in a moment where about half the country believes there are, that the election was stolen. Maybe a third of the country now believes the election was stolen. But if you're in a democracy and you believe that your vote doesn't count, that's dangerous. So in the short term, I'm, I'm a little pessimistic. But I am, in the long term, very optimistic for this country because I look back at trends. I look back at rough times we have been in. And we've always come out. And we haven't just come out of them. We've come out stronger. So look, democracies are not defined by bad days. We're defined by how we come out of those bad days. And so in the long term, I am optimistic. But I, I got to say to people, this is not a moment to rest. This is a moment where you have to understand there have to be uncomfortable alliances to defend democracy. Um, but we can do this. If you had So uh, I guess Adam Kinzinger is optimistic. I mean, but he also thinks that uh, if Trump isn't prosecuted, it gives like license to future future presidents to do like whatever, if anything they want to do to stay in power. And I mean, that's the thing that people on the right wing don't really understand in terms of accountability for Trump and January 6 is Trump is the first president in US history to try to thwart the peaceful transfer of power to like he came up with these frauds with the fake electors he came up with this obstruction of, of an official proceeding which is a violation of uh, 18 USC section 1512 sub C uh, that says you that's a 20-year felony, a, a felony punishable by 20 years in jail if you obstruct an official proceeding like the uh, January 6th proceeding in Congress that's supposed to certify the legitimate electors from all the states. Well, that is a felony in violation of 18 U.S.C. 1512 sub C. You can go Google that yourself and scroll down to subject subsection C of 18 USC 1512 and I mean that's a felony that Trump violated as president that I mean that's never happened before where a president has tried to obstruct the peaceful transfer of power so uh, I think that uh, Adam Kinzinger is right that if we don't prosecute that it like sets the bar really low 
like future presidents uh, I mean Richard Nixon was one thing and he resigned in disgrace so the things he did were like not uh, justified for uh, future presidents but uh, rem remember that clip I showed last week where uh, they were talking about how uh, the best indicator of a successful coup uh, is a failed coup that didn't uh, where the coup plotters were not held accountable that's like the most uh, uh, the best indicator that uh, the best way that coups can become successful is if they try once and they aren't held accountable and they find the weaknesses in the system and uh, that's something I worried about more before the midterms when uh, all the like election denying candidates who were willing to throw the election to the people they wanted to win instead of the people who actually won pretty much all those people were not elected which is why 2022 was a good year for democracy that's my video title here and I guess we'll see what happens in 2023 and of course all the way through 2024 is it going to be Trump uh well I don't know here is Asa Hutchinson uh heavily critical of Trump in this uh next newsmaker clip uh over on ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos talking to Jonathan Carl and uh the thing is he says all these critical things about uh the Trump Republicans and their disregard for the rule of law and all the stuff I've been talking about. But after this clip, he will not commit to not voting for Trump. And I mean, that's kind of disturbing as well, although I'm not going to show that part of the interview. But I will talk more about the clip I am going to show after we watch it together over here. So I, I want to I know you're thinking about a run for president. I want to get to that. But first, it, it's been a six weeks since Donald Trump announced and it's been it's been quite a six weeks. He had a uh, dinner with an anti-Semite and, and a white supremacist. Uh, the, his tax returns have been a release showing that he was uh, awash uh, in debt, uh, uh, losing money, not paying much in taxes, that he tried to trademark tried to trademark the term rigged election. He floated the idea of nullifying part of the Constitution uh, so that he could nullify uh, the 2020 presidential election. Um, and he hasn't done a single event, at least that I can see, a public event outside of, of the uh, outside of Mar-a-Lago. Uh, what, what is your sense? Donald Trump, is, is he at this point, like some of the polls suggest, actually the front runner for the Republican nomination? Well, I, th I think you have to start him out as the front runner simply because uh, he's polling that well. He's the former president. But as I have said all through 2022, uh, he does not define the Republican Party, and we have to have other voices. And to me, uh, that's the key thing for the future. And whenever you look at uh, what's happened uh, with Donald Trump since he announced that he's going to run again for president is that you've had continued chaos that has surrounded him. He has actually been fairly quiet. And so it's it's an opportunity for other voices to rise that's going to be problem solving, common sense conservatives, and they can shape the future of the Republican Party, but also provide the right counterbalance to Biden's failed policies. And to me, that's what we have to do in 2023. His popularity among Republicans has certainly come down, but it's, he's still overwhelmingly popular among uh, Republican voters. How does a how does somebody how does a fellow Republican challenge him, bring down that uh, bring down that popularity and beat him among Republican voters in a primary? What's the key? 
Well, first of all, <clears throat> you have to get in there. You have to endure. You have to realize it's going to be a longer campaign, most likely, with a number of candidates in there. A and then you have to also see that it's different than 2016 when uh, Donald Trump was new on the national scene. He was uh, uh, somebody that uh, everybody liked, uh, his anger, he, his the chaos that he did create. And that's not a new thing anymore. And so so I think people move away from it rather than embrace it. So uh, you need to have simply uh, a message that's authentic to yourself, uh, a message that is problem solving and say this is what we need to do as a country. And that to me is the right contrast. And we have to somehow figure out how to bring people together, both in our party, which is the biggest challenge for 2023, but also for our nation. I do think people uh, are ready to be t for a healing time uh, in both politics, uh, but also in our in our leadership that can uh, work to solve the serious problems that faces from the border uh, to inflation to the economy. Uh, these are issues that people care about and want leaders to address. So, are you going to run? And Adam Kinzinger didn't say whether he was going to run. He kind of dodged that question, but. Uh, I'm sorry, did I say Adam Kinzinger? I meant Asa Hutchinson didn't say whether he was going to run. Uh, but uh, Asa Hutchinson and Adam Kinzinger represent like the small part of the Republican Party that doesn't deny democracy, that doesn't deny that Biden legitimately won the 2020 election, that isn't obsequious to Trump and the Trump base and... Uh, is that enough to save the Republican Party? I mean, 2022 showed that the Trump-endorsed Republicans and the election deniers don't do well with voters. That's why uh, I have Trump along with uh, Putin and Xi Jinping from China as the anti-democratic losers of 2022. But uh, I still don't think that, uh, I mean... The thing is, uh, Trump is going to win the Republican nomination for president in 2024 if he has, like, more than two or three challengers. And he's most likely going to have more than two or three. That's what happened back in 2016, is even though he only got, like, 30 or 40 percent of the vote, he has, like, 30 to 40 percent of the Republican base even still but they have these winner take all primaries and if he has a whole bunch of opponents to split the vote he has a great chance to be back as the republican nominee in 2024 and then <laughs> you saw some coverage of as uh, whether uh, biden will run again in 2024 and I i've seen some like deep analysis is biden going to run is what what uh evidence you know what are the signs what can we use to determine whether biden is going to run for president in 2024 well as a very long-term uh viewer of the political process as someone who's been watching who's been a political junkie since the mid-1980s the the uh biggest indicator to me as to whether Biden is going to run for president in 2024 is the fact that he's been running for president since 1988. I mean, I was, uh, I mean, I remember 19, I was like, uh, working for, uh, Yale students for Gary Hart back in 1988 before he like dropped out again. But, uh, I remember when Joe Biden dropped out of the running for president in 1988 because he was plagiarizing a speech that UK labor leader Neil Kinnock gave about how he was like the child of coal miners. And then it came out Biden plagiarized some law school essay that he wrote and whatever. But Joe Biden has been running for president since 1988. Do you really think 
now that he is president and he has the advantage of being the incumbent president, he's not going to run in 2024. I mean, unless he's actually dying, and I've heard him say, you know, I'm going to look at my health, but that's, I mean, unless he's dying, he's going to run in 2024. That's my 2023 prediction, but you can let me know what you think in the comment section. And now I've shown you the Republican lawmakers or Republican, you know, retiring Republican, retiring anti-Trump Repub Republicans talking about how maybe the Republican Party isn't going to be totally poisoned by Trumpism, but I think they will be. So uh, this next clip is the final clip on the threat to democracy. It's about social media platforms and this is kind of strange how people, I, you know, I live here in the United States and people in the United States apparently are much more worried about the threat to democracy from social media platforms. Here you can see like the deep dive into the Pew Research data that uh, Chuck Todd was talking about in the news summary that I started with earlier or in clip two earlier. Uh, here's some more information that apparently people in the U.S. are more worried than people in the rest of the world. Uh, and I will, this is the data download from NBC News Meet the Press that I'll talk about with you a little more after we watch it together over here. Welcome back, data download time. Social media's impacts are felt all around the world. But Pew Research Center's new Global Attitude Survey shows that the United States is actually an outlier and how Americans perceive social media's impacts on democracy. Bottom line, Americans are a lot more skeptical. Social media's impact on democracy, a bad thing? 35% around the world say it's a bad thing, but here in the United States, 64% say it's been a bad thing. How about whether it's made us more divided? This, there's a little more continuity. 65% around the world, 79% here in America. Are we now less civil? 46% globally agree with that. 69% believe that here in the United States. Uh, and how about social media? Does it make you more informed? Globally, people think it does. 73% versus Americans at 64%. But despite our skepticism, as Americans, we're only, we're using this more and more. Look at this, in 2012, about half of Americans were using social media. Now, essentially three quarters. And look at this, by age group, 18 to 30, this won't surprise. Uh, we, I'd like to know who the 16% who don't use social media are, but 84% of folks under 30, 81% 30 to uh, 50, and even 60% of those folks 50 plus. So we may not like it, but we're becoming more addicted to it. Up next, social media has already changed us and our... <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't know why it is people in the U.S. are more concerned about the effect of social media on our politics than people elsewhere. And that's the deep dive into the Pew Research data that you saw on the data download from Meet the Press. I know that... Uh, about 40% of my live stream viewers are not in the United States. So uh, that's, you know, live viewers and also recorded show viewers. You can let me know what you think, uh, why it is the people in the United States are more concerned about the divisiveness of social media platforms. Uh, compared to people in the rest of the world. I'm, I'm not sure why that is, but I thought that that was one uh, interesting last clip on my main topic of uh, democracy and, you know, how it had a good year in 2022 and what's going to happen in 2023. And I think maybe social media platforms will have something to say about that uh, or maybe meet the press was kind of over hyping that so that they could take the week off and not really uh do their job and show the news this week and last week or whatever you can let me know what you think in the comment section and oh i saw in uh my uh live viewer comments i did get uh one more uh super chat contribution in addition to the happy new year's super chat contribution from tom trask I see Lulu Girl uh, 
Lulu Girl is back this week with a super chat contribution asking about waiting for a kitten. Well, uh, one update I can give you is uh, one of the two rooms where I have to replace the flooring because of extensive pet damage from my pets who died in 2022, including uh, Dash the cat. Well, we I, I paid like a hundred dollars for people to take away a couch from the living room destroyed by dash so now we can get people in to re replace the carpet in that room and uh maybe in the next few months there might be a new kitten so uh that's the update for you lulu girl in response to your super chat contribution so thanks for that uh that uh i mean I'm hoping by the end of uh, the winter, maybe uh, the beginning of spring, spring break sometime before March 20th, maybe there will be a new kitten to announce. And I've also talked about how I'm going to continue doing this live stream all the way through 2024, so two more years. So uh, that's something to think about. And... Then the final newsmaker clip I'm going to show you. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was talking about how I think millions of people might be about to die in China. China has like had this zero COVID policy. This is one of the reasons why Xi Jinping, the leader of China, had a bad year in 2022. Is uh, he is facing this like. Uh, real uh, uh, backlash from the population of China for the zero COVID policy. They just couldn't take it anymore, and so they're like lifting it. But uh, their vaccine isn't very good, and apparently, like uh, millions and mil you know hundreds of millions of Chinese people are about to get COVID, and maybe millions of them might die and uh i talked about that a couple weeks ago as something that could be really bad coming up in 2023 and i haven't seen a lot of coverage of like millions of people about to die in china uh and then face the nation which had some of the best covid coverage way back in the beginning of 2020 like february march 2020 they were like the only programs covering COVID. And I, at that time, if you were watching my Sunday uh, news roundups, I was talking about how CBS News Face the Nation was either overhyping the threat of this unknown virus that was happening in China, or they were the only news program that was covering the biggest story of the year. And as I've said many times, it turned out to be Number two, it was the biggest story of 2020, and only CBS News Face the Nation covered it. Uh, I've even like said, oh, maybe CBS should be the COVID broadcasting system. And they actually covered the threat of COVID in China, but they did it from this weird business angle that was, I mean, so corporate in terms of corporate media. It was kind of disgusting. It was like, oh, the big threat of COVID is it might affect the world economy. I mean... They were the only one who covered it, but in kind of a disgusting way, I will talk about a little more after we watch that final news clip. This is the uh, managing director of the International Monetary Fund, uh, Kristalina Georgieva, talking to Margaret Brennan on CBS News Face the Nation yesterday. Over here. The global economy also saw some serious turbulence in 2022. We spoke with the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, Kristalina Georgieva, as she wrapped up year-end business at the IMF here in Washington. China has been this hub of cheap manufacturing for the world. We are all so dependent on it. But right now, it looks like COVID cases are exploding mm -hmm. as they start peeling back those zero COVID restrictions. What will that mean for the global economy, long and short term? Uh, in the short term, bad news. Uh, China has slowed down dramatically in 2022 because of this tight zero COVID policy. 
For the first time in 40 years, China's growth in 2022 is likely to be at or below global growth. And looking into next year, for three, four, five, six months, the relaxation of COVID restrictions would mean bushfire COVID cases uh, throughout China. I was in China last week in a bubble in a city where there is zero COVID, but that is not going to last once the Chinese people start traveling. They don't have an effective vaccine right now. The, the vaccinations uh, fall behind. They have not uh, worked on antiviral treatments and how that can be offered to people. And so they will go through this tough time. If they stay the course over time, they would be able to catch up with the rest of the world. But for the next couple of my months, it would be tough uh, for China and uh, the impact on Chinese growth would be negative, the impact on the region would, in, would be negative, the impact on global growth would be negative. The global economy also saw some serious turbulence in 2022. We spoke with the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, Kristalina Georgieva, as she wrapped up year-end business at the IMF here in Washington. China has been this hub of... I already so show that clip that seemed to restart. I don't know why that clip was restarting. That was weird. But uh, anyway, that was the last newsmaker clip. And I mean, Face the Nation covered the uh, surge in COVID cases from China. I don't know uh, whether you think that was a good way to cover it in terms of the impact on the global economy. What about the possible death of millions of people uh oh and by the way i was watching the live comments there was like somebody in there saying why do i keep closing my eyes and i put that person on like a five minute timeout, which i rarely do because apparently they were making it hard for the rest of the people to engage in the live chat and that's one of my rules if you like spam the comment section so much that people can't engage in uh, commentary, uh, then I will uh, do something to stop you from doing that. Uh, I don't know. I saw s people saying maybe I need moderators for my chats. Uh, I mean, if I had so many people showing up for my uh, live streams that uh, it was really a problem, I might consider moderators, you know, if, but I only have like 30, 40, 50 people per live stream, but See, I, you know, I, I don't really close my eyes. Uh, sometimes I like look down. I have to, I'm both doing the whole like production of the show at the same time I'm doing the like narration, the hosting. And so sometimes I have to like look down at some of the, and my uh, script and my notes. And I mean, I don't have a lot of script, but sometimes I take notes during the clips of things I don't want to forget to say. But I can also like look right into the camera with my eyes wide open. Uh, some of the time I try to do that at the beginning of the show, but when I'm doing all this work during the show, I <laughs> sometimes look down and do other stuff that, uh, where you can't look into my pupils. But is that so important? Do you need to be able to look in my eyes to trust me? Because here, look into my eyes. I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth about the corporate media and the bias that I've been explaining to you for the 10 plus years. No, is it 15 plus years? Yeah, it's over 15 years I've been doing this YouTube channel. So you can look right into my eyes and trust me. Yes, you can. <laughs> I don't know. That was weird. That's like never happened before. Why is he not looking into my eyes? Okay, I looked into your eyes so you can trust me now. And uh, anyway, that's the uh, end of the program. Uh, I hope you appreciate the time and effort I put. It's like eight to ten hours a week I put into my weekly show. Uh, I've been considering maybe in 2023 I might put in some more time to create edited, produce videos. I got some positive response to maybe doing a video about Dave Chappelle, John Stewart, Kanye West, and anti-Semitism. So I 
uh, I might have time to do that sometime this month, January 2023, sometime this month maybe. But anyway, that's all I have to say about uh, the news programs yesterday, this week, but I will be uh, doing these live streams every Monday for the next couple years, and I hope you'll be here to join me or here to watch the show as it's uh, recorded during the week, and until then, I guess I will be seeing all of you around the internet. <laughs>